that's the whole thing is I was at Star Wars was really kind of my life when I was a little kid that was my whole creative world and again I know that there's you know, for a lot of you who are Star Wars fans it's the same same thing there's just something about um, that age and your first kind of creative play being with those toys you know and I remember my dad brought home like the first video camera we ever got when I was like in third grade and I picked that thing up by the top handle and held it down by my knees and ran it through the space between the coffee table and the couch and I played it back and I said god damn that looks just like the trench run in Star Wars <laughs> and, I w and I was hooked it was so unex. I mean, it was very unexpected. It came out of the blue. It really is like if you if you're a Star Wars fan and you're hearing me say this, if you just imagine that Kathy Kennedy sat you down and said, "Would you be interested in this?" and your reaction, that was basically my reaction. I just kind of went numb, and uh, and then I, I I asked if I could think about it <laughs> because I cared I because I care so much about. Um, Star Wars, I wanted to take a breath and I wanted to really think, okay, is, is this something I'm, I'm going to be able to come in and really do? Can I do this? And I, uh, yeah, I... St I started making movies when I was a kid and then yeah there, there was never like any sort of uh, um, like uh, moment of you know I want to be a film director it was just kind of like a slow fade into well I, I love doing this and I just kind of kept doing it and I, I went to film school here in Los Angeles and then when I got out of film school I, I, I wrote um, the script for, for Brick um, right out of school I was like 20 Two or twenty-three, I guess, um, and then basically spent my twenties trying to trying to get brick made, um, and uh, and then finally, right when I was about to turn thirty, finally got it made, and uh, so anyway, that's uh, yeah yeah that's I guess an extremely simplified to the point of being completely useless encapsulation of, <laughs> of how I got into the yeah. film industry. Am I in the film industry? Is this yeah? <laughs> yeah I think you are, so okay, all right, there. all right. <laughs> Um, well, I do storyboards. I do my own like little chicken scratch storyboards, and I'm um, and that's after I've written the script. I take a few weeks and I basically visually write the movie, and I'll just shot for shot draw it out, um, and then I'll sit down with um, uh, my my DP is my uh, best friend, you know, from college, Steve Yedlin, and so he and I have been, you know working together a long time and so we'll I'll sit down and basically I'll I'll translate my indecipherable, you know, little drawings, stick drawings to him, shot for shot. Um, I, when I was in college, I used to carry around that, that book, Scorsese on Scorsese, and I remember him talking about the storyboards that he did for everything, and so maybe I think that's where I got the notion that that's how it's done, I guess, you know. Um, in the script writing process, how do you create and develop your characters? I mean, you have such yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, it's it's weird because it's 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 easier to talk process wise about how you develop plot, but character wise, it's um, it takes a while, and it's something that um, I don't know. It's something that you you have to, and also there's kind of there's no way to talk about it without kind of sounding like a sounding like a, a dork <laughs> sounding like pretentious and kind of because you do you gotta start when you start describing you have to start saying phrases like you know find a connection to the characters get inside their head again inside them let them live and you know and and then they start and then basically hopefully you 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 find a way into them you find a way to bring them to life by connecting up with something inside you and then at, at, the, at some point they start living on their own and then your job is to stay honest to, to what they're doing as a, you know, as opposed to trying to manhandle them into some preconceived thing that you had. So, um, which sounds, sounds kind of goofy, but that's, that's really, I don't know, that's the oh, way yeah, it yeah. is for me. Yeah, 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 you know. Uh, so you said you're a night owl. How, like when and how do you write? I write but sp sporadically and badly <laughs> with no rhyme or reason whatsoever. I, I've, uh, uh, I, I, I think I, I don't think I could ever like actually write for a living, like write for hire, because I, I take so long to write, and I just, uh, um, 
it's bad, man. It's no good. Uh, but I, 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 I end up slip when I end up do start, start actually working. I slide onto typically like a vampire schedule. So I'll, you know, be up till five in the morning or so, and then, you know. But the, the yeah, you know, the middle of the night is the best time to write, I think, because you, you know, the phone's never gonna ring, and there's never you're never gonna have appointments with anybody. It's just kind of um, this quiet time where the rest of the world is is dead. You know? The editing process is, is, it really is like the completion of the writing process. And um, it's, it's also the point where, it's very different from the writing process, obviously though, because with the writing process, you're pulling out of thin air. And whereas with the editing process, it's, it's almost like, um, I don't know, as a writer-director, I find you really have to let go of your ego when you get into the editing room. You have to kind of let go of your preconceptions about what you thought you were creating to some extent. And um, you have to find what the material wants to be, you know, because the first cut that you put together is basically what you had written, your script, you know, and the preconceptions you had, you cut together based on that. And it's, it, you know, invariably it's awful. It's terrible. Uh, I know you have a new film coming out. You still want, you want to talk about that? Are you still working on it? Yeah, it's not I'm writing right now. I'm writing a, a sci-fi thing. That's a, kind of a, it's very different than Bloom. It's kind of a very dark science fiction film called, uh, called Looper. And I'm, uh, this is it. Let's see if I have my notebook with me. No, I don't. I thought I had my notebook with me. I can <laughs> show you the chicken scratches that make up Looper at this point. But. Oh, that would have been so lame. <laughs> we dodged a bullet. <laughs> and Looper, even though we knew that people would see it and it was a big movie and Bruce Willis was in it, we still kind of kept that same ethic of like not thinking about all that but just focusing on making something that we thought was really cool. Felt really sad. And the fact that we weren't making it with the studio but we were making it with, with Endgame, you know, mm -hmm. and so we made it. it, it there was kind of like still the feeling like we were off in our little corner doing something, you know. It, did, it didn't feel like any of this was going to happen when we were on set. And mm -hmm. It was a very focused experience. So where did this idea start with you? Uh, I wrote the idea a long time ago. I wrote the idea about ten years ago as a, as a short film that I never ended up shooting. I wrote mm -hmm. like a three-page short. And uh, I remember telling you about it uh, when we were at Sundance with Brick, actually. So we've been talking about this for a while. Um, so this really is like Twelve Monkeys. Yes, in exactly. Every way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I like to get really deep inside my the influences. Uh, but yeah, I was I, I've been reading a ton of Philip K. Dick, and I wrote this little short, and then it just kind of sat on my hard drive for eight years, and then and then after Bloom is when I picked it back up again. Once we decided that we were making Star Wars movies, he was one of the people that I was immediately interested in. I just think that his storytelling ability and who he is as a human being just exemplified a lot of the values and the sense of fun. I get excited when it feels like it's something new and unique. <laughs> it was very sudden. It was very sudden. It was. Um, I had met Kathy a few times before, just general, kind of you know, getting to know you meetings that you kind of do um, in, in, in the business. And it, it's and we had always got along. I was a big fan of hers, obviously, but um, I had no idea I was in the running for something like this. Uh, I really didn't. And they called me in for another meeting. I had no idea what it was about, so I walked blindly into it, and she just sprung it on me. Um, and I was I was really blindsided, and I, I asked if I could take some time to think about it, actually. Why? Why did you ask time to think about it? Well, I had... And what were you thinking about? Well, no, that's the thing. I, well, I had, you know, I mean, first of all, I had, you know, because my last film, Looper, was like a science fiction film, um, I had been approached with, with bigger stuff and, and just got in the habit of turning it down and just working on my own scripts. Um, and so I was kind of in that mode and I also just, you know, this was different. I, I had been, Star Wars had been a huge emotional part of my life since I was a little kid. It had a deep connection to me going back with my father, like a lot of people in, in our generation, I think. Um, 
So it meant a lot to me. I wanted to really take a breath and make sure that I, I was that I wanted. I was felt like I was able to jump into it and do something that would matter to me. And, so, and, and somewhere, is there a big storyboard or a spreadsheet that says, because uh, we spoke to J.J. Abrams in the last game, so, yeah. you know, and this is, this is the beginning of the story, this is where we think it might go, this yeah. is where you're fitting in, can you make A link to B and, and so on, is, is, was it like that? Not at all, no, that's not how it worked. It was, it was the script for The Force Awakens, which I read and, and loved, and I loved the characters it created and the path it set them on. Um, and then it was a conversation about, okay, what do you think happens next? And that led to, it was very wide open and um, there weren't any bases we had to tag, there wasn't something we had to fit into, there wasn't a place we had to specifically get to. And that led to um, uh, you know, a, a writing process where I could really just find where each of these characters wanted to go and where they wanted to end Clean up. Clean slate? Clean slate, yeah. And it, it led to a, a it led to giving me the freedom to find personally my way into each one of these characters and really figure out organically where it made sense for them to end up. You know? Do you remember, as, as the writer of this film, do you, was there a moment where you sat, I don't know what your writing press is, presumably you're in front of a computer, yeah. where you go, you know, page one, <laughs> and take a deep breath and start? I mean, it's a, is there yeah. a moment that's more exciting? Well, I, I mean, it's, it's a little, I mean, I, the way I write, I spend the first 80% of the process outlining, I'm a big outliner. So I start and just I have these little, just work in little moleskin notebooks and I just, you know, scribble and I draw. I, I, I keep working until I can basically get the whole story drawn on one arc on one page so I can hold it all in my head. Um, and then I start actually writing in the notebooks. I'll write the first draft basically in these little notebooks and then translate it into the computer and that's my first editing pass. So it's a little more diffuse than that. But uh, yeah, there is there is a moment where you type, you know, fade in, <laughs> or not fade in, you type opening crawl and then you start typing it and you type Luke Skywalker for the first time into your screenwriting program. It comes up in your character list and you think, my God, what am I doing? I mean, first of all, like everyone says that there are Star Wars fans now making Star Wars movies. Sure. And it's like, yeah, but if there wasn't Star Wars fans making Star Wars movies, there wouldn't be anybody making Star Wars movies. It's a strange thing, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah, the notion that even like the main official films, like, I don't know, they're, they're, they are the official films, so mm -hmm. they're not fan fiction, but they're fiction being made by fans. Exactly, <laughs> so where yeah. does the line get drawn? Yeah, it's very odd. And it's, you know, I, I think you even see it reflected in these movies. Um, I know, you know, in The Force Awakens, I took a real cue off of that moment where Rey hears Luke Skywalker's name and she's, you see her eyes light up and I thought he was a myth. And we carry that thematically into this film and we kind of had to, it was there not just as a meta thing, but in the actual movie, like mm -hmm. the relationships of the younger characters to these legends that they're meeting. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of baked into the films a Absolutely, little bit, yeah. the element of fandom, I mm -hmm. guess, you know. Yeah, and, and I think that the thing I wanted to sort of ask about that was, as somebody who is a filmmaker and someone who's a fan, how mm -hmm. did you distinguish where that line was? Like when, yeah. you were, when you were making it, did you go like, oh, this moment would be great yeah. as part of the story? Or did you go, hang on, is that that inner fan moment of me going, I would love to see that? I didn't because, I think just because of the way I go about uh, writing, I never felt like the fan part of me was something I had to like put a check on like that. I feel like I, you know, I, I just worked forward in terms of the story. And if there was something that I had in my head, like, oh, it'd be fun to see this or fun to see that, I, I tend to be pretty brutal in the writing process. So anything that didn't actually fit in the story or wasn't there for a reason always ends up falling away anyway. Yeah. Um, so I actually found the fact that I had, like, you know, all these years of just being a Star Wars fan to draw on, I found that to be nothing but a benefit. Um, I mean, how was it kind of waiting for it all to get started? Because I guess you, you must have had to wait to a certain extent for what happened with The Force Awakens to know what yeah. your would be in things. I mean, a little bit, but when I was hired, they were just starting, just about to start shooting Force Awakens. So when I was hired, there was already a script. So step one was I read the script, and um, I kind of dove right in, like it was just, okay, 
where should this go next? It was figuring out where did these characters each go next? What's the journey that makes sense for each of them? And then while I was writing, I was watching dailies. I was watching the footage they were shooting. So I was getting to see the actors bring these roles to life and figure out what I was responding to in their performances. So, um, so no, I kind of jumped right into it um, right from the get-go, uh, which was nice because as soon as you get your hands in and start working, the pressure kind of goes away and you're just focused on the process. It's before the work that you feel the pressure, I think. Yeah. Writing's like, miserable. Nobody, yeah. I don't trust anyone who claims to enjoy writing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's a miserable process. I had the most fun I've ever had writing on this, and oh, it's right. still my least favorite part of the process. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, it's also where you make the movie, really. You know, mm -hmm. it's, um, and yeah, my the way I do it, which is just the way I've always done it, is I work in little moleskin notebooks, and I'll, the first 80% of the process is just working in those little notebooks. Outlining, outlining, yeah. outlining. I think it, I make a mistake sometimes of just going, right, open final yeah. draft, let's start. Well, but then there are filmmakers like I've, I don't, I can't speak for them, I don't sure. know them, but I've heard that the Coen brothers work more like that, where they'll actually just start with an idea and go, and there are other great writers who I'm sure do that and can pull it off. I think it's just whatever works for you. Mm -hmm. now, for me, I have to start with an outline and I start broad strokes and then get the big picture and then drill in, but I'll outline and then I'll even write longhand I'll write the first version of the script in those little notebooks actually wow. like dialogue and everything mm -hmm. um, and then actually going to a computer is the very very last step uh, how does that work with like such a huge like I imagine yeah. when you're making something like Brick like yeah. that, it's like an independent movie you do that in yeah. your own way but with something like this which is such a huge studio movie maybe the yeah. huge studio movie yeah. like how do you like go this is what I got like, and it's like, it's, like all the, it's all the same stuff amazing man. it's all like, the same thing it's words on the page mm -hmm. words for actors to say it's a story mm -hmm. that you gotta follow and you gotta care about the truth is that that's been the big because um, I had the same feeling coming into it that you just described I was like I've never done a studio movie mm -hmm. ever this is my first studio movie and definitely nothing like this scale, mm -hmm. what's going to feel different about it? And the big pleasant surprise for me was how it, it really is the same process as any other movie. You know, you're just telling a story with some actors, trying to make people care about it. Yeah. And uh, other than that, I mean, all the stuff that's bigger, it yeah, it's a bigger production, but it doesn't really affect like what matters about the process. Mm -hmm. Oddly, definitely not the writing. The writing is a great equalizer. It doesn't matter if you're writing fade in space or fade in. Uh, you school. know, school. Yeah. It's it's you're still then you, you you have that log line and then you have to make a scene work. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this film picks up immediately. I don't know. This isn't a spoiler. It picks up immediately. The yeah. last film finishes, which is quite different for for a Star, Star Wars film. Is that yeah. did you know that you was that always the case that we were going to pick up pretty much straight away? Well, that's that's directly from my watching The Force Awakens and the, the amazing moment that JJ ended that movie on of Ray holding the lightsaber out to Luke and. You know, these movies usually jump ahead a few years. Um, I, I want to see what happens next. You know, I thought I need you need to see what happens next in that moment. Um, so, yeah, that led to okay, we're gonna do this a little differently. We're gonna pick it up directly where where that left off. Uh, Steve's talking about is basically while I was the timing of it works so that while I was writing the script for The Last Jedi and even coming up with a story for it, they were shooting The Force Awakens. So they were in London shooting, I was in San Francisco writing, and so I would get weekly kind of reels of kind of the best of everything they had shot that week. And that's, I didn't see a movie while I was, until the script was way done and we were starting prep. Um, but I did get to see these dailies and seeing John, you know, in that part of Finn, seeing Daisy, seeing dailies from the scene between uh, Adam and Daisy, the mind reading scene. Um, it was that kind of stuff that, uh, you know, it, it, it works on the page and you know what you're emotionally reacting to on the page, but until you really see those actors bringing those characters to life and see what you've got, um, being able to kind of see that and write to that was, was a huge deal, actually. There were, though, JJ was really gracious. There was one little thing that I have talked about before that um, I asked if he could change. Originally it was BB-8 that came with Ray to the islands on the Falcon and R2 stayed behind and I just asked him if he could, it was like one it would affect one shot and I asked him if he could switch the droids and he was super super gracious and, and, and did that. The Last Jedi, how early on did you have that title? How close did it come to being something else? Yeah, that was the, I had that title from the word go really before I even started typing the script when I was still coming up with the story for some reason that title just seemed really really right to me and and it never 
changed. And it, it felt so right to me that I was constantly petrified that it was either going to leak online or somebody was going to guess it because I actually thought it was a pretty obvious title. So um, it would, here's a secret. There's there's like, they, it, there's somebody at Disney and Lucasfilm who like monitors for leaks, on potential leaks online. So anytime like an email would pop up with someone from that department, I would hold my breath and click it and just, please don't have guessed the title, don't have the title. And then it would have been, oh, thank God. I mean, there's, there's like... What were the t fake titles that were coming out? People, it was like, you know, there, the Legends of the Jedi Temple or something was like a front runner. And I was like, we got a better title than that. This is going to be good. Well, there was like Reddit threads, which were like pretty much like a computer algorithm, like running through possible Every titles. Every possible combination. Yeah. <laughs> there's only so many. Right. You know? yeah, yeah. The opening crawl. Uh, how did you come up with the opening crawl? How close did it come to being something else? And what is it like writing an opening crawl of Star Wars? It's petrifying, but it's a good way to kind of jump into the pool. You know, it's, it's so when I first started writing the script, I just, I was, I, I realized, oh my God, the first thing I have to write is an opening crawl for a Star Wars. And so I, I just did it. I just wrote a version of it. And the truth is, it's, um, it is, and I've heard in interviews, Lucas talk about this. He kind of talks about it as if it's like a poem, sort of. And um, that made a lot of sense to me, having gone through this. Not because you're like getting poetic with it or whatever, but because every single word matters. And um, it is this sort of thing. It was the very last piece of writing in the movie that we were working on, literally like a few days before we had to give the movie up and say, okay, we can't touch it anymore. So when I realized that what Luke's arc was going to be through this and the whole notion of, and that itself was like a, a big, long process. It was kind of the first thing I felt like I had to figure out coming into it was, and it all stems from one question, which is what is Luke doing on that island? You know, why is he taking himself out of the fight? And it's got to be a reason that I believe in from his perspective, from his point of view, um, and the reason that feels consistent with who he is. And... Um, and so once I kind of landed on that and figured out, okay, he thinks he's doing the right thing by taking the Jedi out of the equation, and then that means he's rejecting this whole notion of the, the galaxy having this blind hero worship of this legend of Luke Skywalker, and he thinks if he takes that out of the equation, then, then maybe the light will be able to rise from a worthier source, and his whole thing is, and the path of the movie is him realizing that no the galaxy needs that and the galaxy needs that legend and they need the hope that that brings and he needs to step up and be that for everybody and then once he does that at the end once he does kind of you know it's it's not about him beating somebody with a lightsaber it's not about him winning a fight it's about him lighting this big beacon of hope that is the legend of luke skywalker for people to look up to once he does that, the notion that, okay, we've now built this huge emotional arc for him. This is now the place for him having accomplished this, both in terms of thinking of the most powerful point for him to then choose to pass on, but also thinking about looking at, I didn't know what was going to happen in 9. At that point, I didn't even know who's going to be making 9. But the notion that him like passing to the next realm would actually give more potential for you know what his role could be in nine as opposed to him just still being around and kind of going along with them on the on the mission or whatever so all of this led up to oh wow okay so this this needs to happen in the end of the movie i think the expectation that this would be you know much closer to the luke from that was the hero that like his hero's journey in the original trilogy right and whereas for me, this is 30 years later, and not only that, this is, um, you know, with, with, if you look at any classic kind of hero's myth that actually is worth its salt, um, if you look at, at the beginning of the hero's journey, like with King Arthur, he pulls the sword from the stone, he's ascendant, he has setbacks, but he unites all the kingdoms, he gets all his knights together, or, or Beowulf with him, you know, killing Grendel's mother and, and taking it all down and having that victory and getting his own hall. And there's always that first arc, but then any one of these things that then put, if you keep reading, and if it then goes f past that and deals with the hero's life as they get into middle age and beyond, yeah. it always starts to get into, you think about 
King Arthur betrayed by his, you know, best friend and his wife, and then ultimately, depending on what version you read, having coming up against uh, the the product of you know somebody who has completely usurped his kingdom and the product of incest from him, and he has to kill him, but only at the cost of his own life. And it's just it gets into darker places. It gets dark, man. Well, it's yeah, really and Beowulf falls, and just you, and there's a reason for that. It's yeah. because. Myths are not made to sell action figures. Myths are made to reflect the most difficult transitions we go through in life. Yeah. And that early part of the hero's journey is reflecting our, I think, this is my interpretation, going from adolescence into adulthood, where you're ascendant and you're finding yourself and you're winning. In order for something that addresses middle age and beyond in a really honest way, if you look at the myths, they, they, like the Fisher King, you know, it deals with disillusionment. It feels like starting to fi feel like you're losing your place in the world. It feels like everything changing and loss. Um, and that's because they're honest, and that's because they have to be honest, because that's what these things are there for, you know? And I feel like it would be a betrayal of them and of Luke Skywalker as a character not to take it seriously enough to reflect that, I think, and to just give us the waxworks version of Luke that, we've, we've, you know, that we yeah. might love and expect because he's up there and, and he has it's the action figure in plastic on our wall looking heroic and stuff but if you if, if you want to take him seriously as a character for me at least it felt important to to go into that realm so anyway as you can tell by my 45 minute dissertation <laughs> I, you thought about it a little bit there was i've given it some thought <laughs> yeah. but a lot of that thought was because you know and to mark's credit it was because mark challenged me on it and because i had to then articulate this stuff i had to think it through i had to get into this felt right to me but why did it feel right? And I couldn't just say, screw you, because this is my story, because because you can't do that. You know, yeah. you have to get into the conversation, and that's nothing but a good thing, you know, so. One of the things that, that I love about this movie, I think I mentioned it to you before, is how anyone can be a hero. It's, uh, it's, it's awesome, it's beautiful, and it resonates. Uh, how early on did you know that that was gonna be like a major theme of the film? Well, it's interesting, because that was, it definitely was something that like slowly kind of emerged, but I mean, the truth is um, that was never kind of like a driving thing for me in the movie. And I've talked a little bit elsewhere about, you know, obviously the big decision with Ray and her and her parents. That is, um, you know, that's one of the big things of, okay, you're, you're, it's cutting loose the idea of her being special coming from lineage. And that is true, and I do like that. I think, and I think that's a good thing. That wasn't, though, the motivating factor behind that decision it was it was more of a dramatic decision of just what is the toughest thing that she could hear about her parents um, what is the thing for her and us that will make her have to stand on her own two feet and and will just make things hardest for her because she's the hero and that's her job is for things to be hard for her so um, so it was more it came from that and the the other element of it was something that came along with that that I also really liked but it's not like I I I, you know, I didn't set, sit down with, how do we overturn this whole thing of, of Star Wars lineage? That, that wasn't the driving factor. It was almost like a byproduct of a natural process of, oh, this is what's gonna make sense for her as a, as a character, as a dramatic turn there. And that means this, and that's kind of nice. So that then works into the rest of the movie like this. And it's, I don't know, it's kind of a hazy dramatic, you know, it's kind of a, a, a strange um, organic process, I guess. A lot of people say that uh, the broom boy at the end uh, must be significant because he has the force and we see him on screen showing he has it. Uh, but I feel that it's it's part more of the larger theme that anyone can be a hero, the rebellion. Can you talk about that kid and his significance? How close did he, uh, the broom boy, uh, come to the editing room floor? <laughs> uh, well, I like the way you think about him. Uh, and yeah, it was, it was something that I don't think it was ever... Um, I don't know, does he have a name besides Broom Boy? He does. Pablo made up a totally unpronounceable name that I can never remember. I call him, I, thought I like Broom Boy. Let's stick with Broom Boy. It was never something that was, I think, actually, in my mind at least, I, I was never going to cut it from the movie. It was something that occasionally would would come up, like, because we had that really nice scene with Leia and Ray and everybody in the Falcon. You're pulling back and it zooms off into hyperspace. You could iris out right there. But the truth is, for me, that scene was, um, at the end, with the kid, was more than nice, and it was more than 
uh, it wasn't really even about the kid and everyone can be a hero. It was about Luke and Luke's sacrifice. And to me, it was about Luke's uh, ultimate act of coming back and accepting this mantle. I mean, I guess the first thing to say is coming into writing this or any story, the object is not to subvert expectations. The object is not surprise. Yeah. I think that would lead to some contrived places. The object is drama. And, and in this case, the object was figuring out path for each one of these characters where we challenge them and thus learn more about each of them by the end of the movie. So that having been said, Kylo's arc in this movie, I saw as, okay, I want, besides his relationship with Rey, the big arc for Kylo in this movie was breaking down this kind of unstable foundation that he's on and then building him to where by the end of the film, he's no longer just a Vader wannabe, but he stepped into his own as kind of a quote unquote villain, but a complicated villain that you understand, yeah. right? So with that in mind, the idea that Kylo would get to that place by the end of it led me to think, well, then what is Snoke's place at the end? Does that work with him just kneeling before Snoke at the end? No, if Kylo's got to get to a place of actual power, the ultimate expression of that would be him, you know, ascending beyond his, his master. Uh, and that also then gives the opportunity to have a great dramatic moment that you don't expect of getting, getting Snoke kind of out of the way. Um, so that really is where it all, it all stemmed from. It was, it was thinking about Kylo's path, thinking about where I wanted him to be at the end of the movie to set him up for the next film and thinking, okay, that means we're going to clear away this slightly more familiar dynamic of the uh, emperor and the, the pupil, clear the boards from that. And then that's much more exciting going into nine, the notion of now we just have Kylo as the one that they have to deal with. Um, yeah. You can no longer take a rational guess at how the, the Snow Kylo thing is going to play out in the next movie. Yeah, I have no idea. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's exciting. Uh, um, Kylo says that line, uh, kill the past, yeah. and, uh, whatever. It seems like your movie is kind of also kind of representative of that. Like, to move on with Star Wars, yeah, to move yeah. on to the future, you kind of have to let go of... Uh, well, it's an interesting aspect of it. It's an interesting theme. And it's, you know, for me, the balance was... Because Kylo is saying that, and interestingly to me, Luke is kind of saying his own version of that as well. And uh, it's really Ray who is the balance, who I think, and Ray is where my heart lies in terms of in that theme and where we end up by the end of the movie. But Kylo was a really, that, that was the character that I was most excited about getting into and, and writing and coming out of The Force Awakens, seeing that character. And uh, because in you know, the first Star Wars films, Vader was a great villain, but he was never someone that you identified with. You only identified, you identified with Luke's relationship to him. Whereas, uh, especially in the context of these stories being about, you know, the transition from adolescence into adulthood. So you're identifying with Luke, he's the one going through that transition, and Vader is something he has to, he has, essentially has to navigate to get there. Whereas with Kylo, Kylo is not really that for Rey. Kylo is, it's almost like Rey and Kylo are two halves of the protagonist. He, uh, Rey the dark and Ky or Rey the light and Kylo the dark. And that is thrilling to me. The, that's my favorite kind of, of bad guy are the ones that you identify with. And in this case, in a way, you identify with him as much as you do Rey. When we were preparing to make this movie, um, we watched a bunch of films. We watched, uh, I sat down with the story group and I came up with, at Lucasfilm, I just came up with a list of movies I thought would be good to kind of draw inspiration from. And 12 O'Clock High was one of them, which is the great film with, with Gregory Peck, and it's kind of about World War II bombers. And that ended up uh, leading to this opening sequence of uh, kind of a bombing run. I love this character of Maz. Um, in early drafts of the script, there was more Maz in it. Originally, I had her actually on the cruiser, and um, I just slowly found as I was writing it that so much of the stuff I had her doing, especially as the script got bigger and bigger, I could be more economical if I had if gave, gave those beats to our main characters. Uh, the character of DJ came about basically as I was coming up with what Finn's whole journey was going to be. Um, the notion of 
and this is something that uh, I don't know was was uh, for me. I really kind of related to Finn's whole journey of being one where it's it's you know he's left the bad guys, but is there a, a is you know the cynicism of DJ that DJ brings to it, and Finn having to decide. There is yes, there is cynicism. Yes, there is corruption. Yes, it's a big messy system. But there are people fighting for the right things and people fighting for the wrong things. And I want to be fighting with the people for the right things. And that felt like a really powerful thing to actually challenge and for Finn to actually get to by the end of the movie. And that meant I had to present in the most seductive way possible the cynicism of it all. So I knew it had to be a new character because it had to be someone who was genuinely. Cynical to his bones. He was not a scoundrel with a heart of gold who's going to turn around at the end. He really believed in this point of view, and that's where the creation of DJ came. And you know, the movie is kind of structurally built around uh, sort of our three leads. There's there's Finn, there's Ray, and there's Poe, um, and each one of them has uh, kind of uh, and sort of like an angel and a devil on their shoulder a little bit. You know, Ray has Luke and Kylo. Uh, Poe has Leia and Holdo, and that's a little different. And uh, and Finn has DJ and and Rose. And so I needed the balance of someone to balance Rose, and that's kind of where DJ came from. Uh, so uh, the hardest to write for is, you know what? Honestly, it was um, just in terms of figuring out what their story was going to be. Honestly, it was Poe because Poe is uh, such a clear cut, simple character in Seven, and he's awesome because he's just Oscar Isaac and he's like the most charismatic man in the universe and he's just rad. Um, but then, yes, absolutely, give it up. Uh, but, and honestly, I was, um, I was, I was, talking about this the other day, I actually um, wrote in the first, very first draft I wrote of it, like Poe went with Finn on the mission to Canto Bite, and the two of them were going to be together on the mission. Um, and it didn't work at all because those two get along too well, and so it was just really boring. Um, and so that when I split them apart, I, I thought, okay, so Poe can have his own deal. God, what is Poe's deal? What's his... And that's uh, finding the thing of, oh, okay, so... He's a hero, but he has to learn how to become a leader. And he has to, Leia needs him to mature beyond uh, kind of brash heroics into someone who can actually take on the mantle of leading this this resistance. Um, but kind of getting there. I guess that, I, I, I guess I didn't even think, like Luke was obviously the, the hardest overall. But of besides for Luke, I guess, you know, the, the Poe was probably the trickiest. It, of all the surprises and twists, was there anything that kind of surprised me? I'm a, yeah, all... I mean, the short answer is all of them. I mean, that's the thing. You try and, like, because because it really is this strange thing, and I don't know if you if you write, you probably experience the same thing, where um, this always sounds so kind of like, you know, artsy-fartsy when you say it, but it's genuinely actually nuts and bolts true that if you, you the story is, is going forward, as a writer, it's more a process of discovery than it is construction. And especially when you hit something that feels right, it always surprises you because it's 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 more like uncovering dinosaur bones of a skeleton that wants to have a certain shape than it is sculpting something. I guess if that makes sense. Well, it was. I mean, I I didn't find the the writing process to be that. It's weird. It's it, I tried and failed to kind of articulate concisely why it didn't feel that different from writing. A movie that but from scratch, at least the ones that I have. I guess mostly because the movies I've written from scratch have mostly been genre movies or spins on genre movies. And so with those, you're working with a certain box anyway. That box is the genre, and you choose how to ride it, how to use it, how to subvert it, how to pay it off. And with this, it was kind of a similar thing, except the genre was a Star Wars movie. And it was a genre I deeply loved and something I felt like I, you know, I knew, I had a personal, everyone has their own idea of what a Star Wars movie is, obviously, but I felt my personal idea of what it was was a very strong thing I've had since childhood. So um, it actually felt oddly, odd, you know, the, the process felt oddly familiar and definitely not more restrictive than um, any of the previous things I've written. Ram, I understand that Ryan made life a lot easier than it could have been by getting the script in early. You guys had a lot of time to, to work on things, right? Ryan delivered the script, I think, 13, the first draft that everybody responded, Kathy and everybody in the studio responded super positively, probably like 13 or 14 months before we start filming. She doesn't really have any this world and this kind of, you know, big movies. So we had a lot of time to prep and that made the process very smooth and allowed us to make this ambitious movie. I mean, The Force Awakens had not 
even been fully in the canon, right? When you turned in your yeah, I started. Well, no, I started writing just as they were going into their production into shooting it. So um, I had read the script, and then I was watching dailies from The Force Awakens, and I was writing what happens next, kind of based on that. Remember, we started shooting this movie before Seven came out. That's, that was weird. That's actually true. That's legitimately true. Yeah. I was just reminded of that wow, right forgot. out here. Yeah. He wrote the script, which I, I'm sure a lot of people don't necessarily realize. I think it's something that he thought about a long time before he ever put pen to paper. And then he went off. I remember he was in a driving snowstorm up in the mountains, putting the final touches on the script. And then he came back just bubbling over with ideas and excitement. So he has this interesting way that he works where he needs that time alone. And then he's so incredibly collaborative when he comes into the process of making a movie. That's fantastic. It sounds like it was a really good working relationship. Yeah. A lot of fun. Really great. Awesome. What would you say excites you the most about The Last Jedi? You know, I think he's done an exceptional job of taking these new characters and some of the legacy characters and moving us to this next place. I think he doesn't answer all the questions. I will say that up front. But Good. there are certain questions he does answer in a really wonderfully provocative way. And I think there'll be some surprises that people aren't expecting. Yeah, the collaboration with Kath, with Kathleen Kennedy. Um, no, it was, I mean, again, very collaborative from the very start. But um, it, there was, no, the pushback was, uh, I mean, it, the, the the type of pushback that always happens when you're coming up with a story, which is, oh, I don't know about that, but maybe this, okay, that, then maybe this. But there was nothing where it was just like her, like, shutting you down. That's not her style, honestly. Like, I, I felt, and coming into it, I, that was one of the big questions for me, is what is this process going to be like? Because I've just always written my own stuff and made it. And, um, I mean, the process felt, you know, kind of, kind of shockingly close to that. Kathy just put a lot of faith into, into, you know, into us and the story group, and and then and she obviously, you know, was really on board with what we did. I guess. Yeah. It it was never a situation where I was like coming up with a bunch of stuff, writing a script, and then putting it through a slot and holding my breath, like, are they gonna like this? And that was part of why I wanted to just mo again move up to San Francisco and be involved with them during the process of coming up with all this stuff so literally the entire thought process from square one as to how we got to each of these decisions um they were involved in and 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 we worked together on it was very collaborative um and because of that also even the stuff that um even the stuff that feels like it kind of pushes it out there because we all went on the journey together of kind of discovering it um no yeah it never felt scary and also because i guess we all knew how we got there and believed in it, I think, and it felt honest to all of us. That was always the big litmus test, is does this feel honest and true to these characters we, we grew up with? Um, and so because of that, it, I don't know, it never felt like, oh, are we actually doing this? It felt like, yeah, if this is true, then this is true, and this makes sense, and so, yeah. But the truth is that you didn't do this in a vacuum. You wrote a script that you showed Kathleen Kennedy and you showed the people at Lucasfilm and the story group and there's a big group of people that sign off on the idea and what you're going to do. It's not like you in a vacuum saying, I'm doing this. Yeah. You know what I mean? So can you sort of talk about the collaboration with Lucasfilm and with the key people that where you're pitching your ideas and getting feedback? It was a very collaborative process and that's, and I wanted it to be, you know, that was kind of the the whole reason I, I moved up to San Francisco for a few months while I was coming up with the story. Um, I mean, I really, you know, I love Kathy. I really fell in love with um, Kiri Hart and Pablo and all the folks in the story group up at Lucasfilm. They are just the smartest, coolest people whose hearts are so in the right place for all this stuff. So, I mean, when I moved up there, I, I wanted to come in. I would come in a few times a week. I would just dump everything that I was thinking of on the table with these guys, and we would try and be really just thoughtful in terms of working through it all. And, um, I mean, the truth is, more than anything, more than holding me back, they 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 were give it. They gave me permission, I guess, to try stuff that I might have otherwise self edited out of out of fear. They were really like, I don't know. They were they were they were just wonderful creative collaborators, I guess. But yeah, it is. It's a very collaborative and an incredibly thoughtful process. Every single thing that's in the movie, there's all of us. Just you know, um, we we. We, we give a lot of thought as to, especially the big stuff. I mean, you know, we grew up with this stuff. We, we, 
love it dearly. It means a lot to all of us, obviously. And so, you know, we want to get it right. Lucasfilm puts out a lot of books, comics, uh, a lot of canon, uh, you know, everything that they're producing. How much do you look at that and in the writing process and, you know, try to incorporate it? And how much are you sort of just writing it and then Lucasfilm can tell you, no, that that doesn't work because we did it in that comic book? Right. Um, well, because this new trilogy, first of all, because of kind of the, you know, um, the decision that was made way before I, I came on board that all like the backlog of all the extended universe stuff was not gonna uh, like officially apply canon wise to this. The fact that we were forging ahead in the timeline with this new trilogy meant there wasn't a lot of stuff that we had to back into in terms of that. But still, um, you wanna be true to the spirit of it. And so I would, I didn't, you know, I, I basically, Pablo was my, uh, and I, Pablo Hidalgo, I don't know if I read, he's a, um, he works at Lucasfilm. He w he's been there for years and years. He's one of the loveliest man's, men on the universe, and he's he's also just kind of the keeper of the flame of 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 Star Wars lore. And he was kind of my my spirit animal through the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. So the, basically, one of the really interesting things when I wrote the script. Um, uh, when I wrote the script, the inner cutting, the Star Wars-y kind of inner cutting of all the main plots, um, there was a lot more of it originally, and I and I find this interesting. One of the things, once we got in the cutting room and started putting the whole movie together, um, you would think that big inner cutting would increase the energy and increase the pacing, and for some strange reason, it did the opposite, and we ended up, my editor Bob Doucet and I, we ended up more and more shuffling stuff and like putting big chunks together and letting sequences play out for longer. Um, and the big example of that is the whole section from basically when Ray leaves the island to when the Mega Destroyer blows up, Holdo blows the Mega Destroyer up. That whole segment of Finn and Poe with their mission, and they're on the Mega Destroyer, sneaking in, getting caught, and Rey in the throne room, and all the stuff in the hangar. Originally, that inner cut a lot more. If you watch the movie, you notice, basically, Finn and, uh, Finn and Rose's mission on the Mega Destroyer and Poe's mutiny play out in one long string. And originally, that was written and originally cut to be hopping back and forth a lot more with Rey and Snoke in the throne room. Um, it just didn't work, and I think it's, it, it it was just a, a matter of once you were in one of those storylines, you wanted to see it through. It, it made it feel elongated by hopping back and forth. 100%. The editing process is, I'm not saying anything new here, but it's the completion of the writing process, you know. It's its where you finish writing the movie. Did you find anything in this where you were just like, hang on, if I put that there instead? An like... insane amount of stuff. At right. some point, I want to release, the, I want to put out there like the work, like the, the shooting draft of the script so that everyone can, and that's actually what we shot and how we first assembled it, so Amazing. that everyone can see how much shuffling and splicing and taking stuff out and rearranging stuff, we ended up doing quite a lot. Because you, you have to, again, it's similar to being on set. It's not like you can just stick to your plan. You gotta make the movie work. And if something about it isn't working, and inevitably it won't be, you put that first assembly together, if you watch it and don't want to shoot yourself in the head, then you're doing something wrong. You <laughs> always want to just hide under a rock after you see the first assembly. And then you get to work and you start, okay, God, this we spent a week and built this magnificent set to shoot this scene, but it's slowing us down and we don't need it. You uh, asked JJ to adjust something in episode seven that uh, for, for episode eight, uh, JJ is doing nine. He came on publicly late to the process did Lucasfilm or JJ ask you to adjust anything in eight because of nine? Well, because of the timing, there really wasn't, yeah, that there really wasn't that opportunity because when he came on and started coming up with the stuff, it was too late. We had already delivered the movie. So, um, yeah, there's, unless we special edition that shit. <laughs> I don't know. With, with, no. I was no. going to say, with Star Wars, you never know. Do I have a favorite line of dialogue in the film? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I should have thought of something. <laughs> I should have realized that question. Uh, I really, that my favorite lines are all really dumb little things. Like, uh, you know what my favorite line of dialogue is? That um, I didn't write, actually. This was something that Benicio came up with. Uh, when Finn says, you know, you're wrong to him, originally I had written some 
movie line where he's like, yeah, I'm wrong and rich or something like that, something terrible. And Benicio was the one who like sidled up to me in between takes and was like, I don't like that line, man. Sounds like a movie line. I was like, yeah, that does sound like a movie line. You're right. And he said, I mean, I'll just say maybe. I was like, yes, yes. So that's my favorite line of dialogue. <laughs>